Coming up on Chopper's Politics. Yeah, no, I wasn't wearing shorts and sandals. I was fully dressed above the waistline. I was wearing some black jeans <laughs> below the waistline, if I'm going to be painfully honest. Hello, I'm Christopher Hope, The Telegraph's Chief Political Correspondent, and welcome to Chopper's Politics, your weekly update on all things Westminster and coronavirus related. I hope you've listened to our special episode last week with legendary historian David Starkey. Jack Spratt, 99, enjoyed it as he left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. He said, despite considering myself a wishy-washy liberal, I think Chopper's podcast set the standard for informed and good-humoured debate. And the latest offering, with the incomparable David Starkey, is all of those things and a must-listen. Thank you, Jack, even if you are a wishy-washy liberal. And if you enjoy the podcast, please do leave us a review and a rating. It really helps others find this podcast. Now, this week, we've seen our first virtual Prime Minister's questions in the House of Commons chamber, with a majority of MPs asking questions remotely from their homes. Although we noticed a certain former leader of the Labour Party decided to make an appearance in person. First Secretary of State Dominic Raab stood in for Prime Minister Boris Johnson and faced questions from Sir Keir Starmer, the new Labour leader, about the daily testing target. To talk about that and much else besides, in today's episodes, I'll be joined by former Health Secretary and, of course, the current Chairman of the Health Committee in the House of Commons, Jeremy Hunt. But first, we thought you could benefit from some soothing, dulcet tones in these difficult times. And there are no tones more dulcet than those of Geoffrey Cox QC, the former Attorney General. As today is, of course, Shakespeare's birthday and St George's Day, we thought we'd ask him to read us some rousing words of wisdom. Geoffrey Cox, morning, how are you? Good morning, I'm very well. All better to hear your voice, Chris. And where does this podcast find you this day? I'm in the deepest wilds of greenest West Devon, and it's a beautiful day here, even if we can't enjoy it to its full. Isn't it strange times? I remember bumping into you in Portcullis House and we discussed you doing a reading for this uh, for this podcast back in January. I mean, that was just a normal interaction, or was it February? And now, now look at us, we're just isolated in our individual homes. It's strange and difficult, isn't it? These are extraordinary times, I think. We have to go back a hundred years and... Uh... Uh, I think we're all feeling... Uh, what I am pleased about, though, is the sense of solidarity. Here in West Devon, there's a huge amount of voluntary activity going on, and uh, it's heartening to see just how much people are standing by each other through these difficult times. Yes. Are you volunteering yourself? Are you doing some special cakes and tray bakes for the local NHS? Well, I don't know that I'm... I'm not much of a baker, but I am <laughs> involved in coordinating some of the voluntary effort, and, uh, you know, it's a series of constant uh, online conferences and liaising with the councils and so on. I think all MPs are doing that. I think the time has come for David Cameron's big society, about 10 years too late, but it does feel like that, like that doesn't it? It's usually when these kind of external threats are present that we remind ourselves of how much we have in common, I think. Yeah. Now, your familiar voice, of course, you're familiar in your own right uh, in the legal circles and also as an MP. But last year, you were the Attorney General who, who managed to navigate a path through the Brexit crisis. The talks are ongoing and the government has not wavered from this idea of leaving the transition period at the end of this year. That's a good thing, is that right? I think the government must stand firm. I think unless uh, it stands firm on its time limits... There will be a temptation to think that the can can be kicked further down the road. That doesn't mean that there might not be a good reason for flexibility at some point, but let's see what we can achieve by the set date. Yeah, because deadlines always focus minds in journalism and also doing treaties <laughs> and also your game in law. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't have a deadline, the risk is that people feel it can just be procrastinated about and postponed. Uh, we must concentrate on getting this done, even though we're now so preoccupied with this immediate emergency. Yeah. And with that in mind, we've asked you back onto the podcast to do the readings we discussed. Uh, you were a huge hit at Christmas when you read Twas the Night Before Christmas. It was heard by fans of yours or new fans of yours in Los Angeles and across the world. It was quite a hit. Well, thank you to The Telegraph. Well, we are merely the, the, the vehicle to sound your voice across the globe for this podcast, and it's an honour to, to do so. And we've chosen some readings for this podcast, and you're going to read, it, read some now. Jeffrey Cox, would you like to say what it is? Well, the first reading, Chris, which uh, I've known for many years, it's a great speech. It's the speech of Jayquiz in As You Like It, All the World's a Stage. 
Lovely. Well, take it away, Geoffrey Cox. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy, with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honour, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice. In fair round belly, with good capon lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon. With spectacles on snows and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big, manly voice turning again toward childish treble pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange, eventful history. His second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. Geoffrey Cox, that was terrific. Thank you so much. And there's more from Geoffrey later. Thank you. Pleasure, Chris. But stay with me. In a moment, I'll be talking to Jeremy Hunt, the former health secretary and the current chairman of the health committee in the House of Commons, right after this. Hi, listeners. It's Bryony Gordon here. I'm popping into this podcast to tell you all about another Telegraph series called Mad World. It's a podcast in which I chat to household names and unsung heroes about their mental health. From Nadia Hussain from Bake Off to frontline nurses working flat out to save lives. We talk about looking after ourselves during this strange time and remind you that even when you're isolating, you are not alone. Search Mad World wherever you usually download your podcasts. Right, welcome back. Now, as of today, there are just seven days to go before Health Secretary's Matt Hancock's target of 100,000 daily coronavirus tests must be met. Yet recent daily figures show the numbers are way below that. And someone who's been pushing for mass testing from very early on in this crisis has been former Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt. And Jeremy joins us now. Jeremy Hunt, welcome to Chopper's podcast. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from my home in Surrey, um, which I'm very proud has been one of the first places in the country to ask a virtual question in our virtual parliament. So I um, sat on my sofa and asked a question to Matt Hancock yesterday. Uh, how do you, were you wearing um, fully dressed? Were you? I, mean, I was fully you, dressed. It's a weird wearing thing. Wearing shorts you know. and sandals. Yes. Yeah. I know. I wasn't wearing shorts and sandals. I was fully dressed above the waistline. I was wearing some black jeans <laughs> below the waistline, if I'm going to be painfully honest. I thought I was watching it from home too, and I felt that it gave, it, it, it was r- refreshing to have Parliament questioning the ministers again. Having having been frustrated by some of the questioning, I think in the in the daily press conference, it was just great to have you guys uh, doing it. I thought it, it thought it, and there was good good questions too. I thought very focused. Yes, I think what you get in that virtual environment is the positive is there's no grandstanding or playing to the gallery. The negative is that people can warble on, and you don't have that kind of group pressure to shut up when you're wobbling on too long so 
there are positives and negatives. Jeremy Hunt, thank you for coming on this podcast. It's terrific to have you on. And, and it will, of course, it's all about, all about coronavirus. I want to start with your time as health secretary between 2012 and 2018. And during that time, there was a thing called Exercise Cygnus in October 2016, involving all major government departments and looked at the UK's preparedness for a pandemic. Do you think lessons were not learned or even ignored from that exercise? And the first thing to say is that we are all going to have to learn huge lessons uh, when we reflect on how we dealt with coronavirus as a country. And that isn't just the current government. It's me during my time as health secretary. It's even previous governments that had to deal with swine flu, for example. But I think the, the biggest thing that we should have done more of was think about what we would do with a SARS-like virus because the biggest divide in the response to coronavirus has been between the Asian economies that had that experience of SARS going back to 2003. And all our preparations in the West tended to focus on flu-like pandemics. And I think that's been the central reason why their response has, on the whole, been more effective than in Europe and the United States. Did you see the the results of uh, Exercise Cygnus when it came out? Yes. And, um, you know, we learned lots of lessons about how to deal with a pandemic flu, including doing all the preparations for the emergency legislation that was put in place. But in the end, this wasn't a flu-like virus. This was a coronavirus. And that requires a whole different approach based on the the testing and the contact tracing and, and all the things that we can see places like Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, did better than European and American economies. I can see that. What would you have done differently? Goodness, I mean, hindsight is a huge benefit in this situation. Uh, you, can you see why Whitehall was caught a bit unprepared for this? Well, I think the main thing we should have done is said, you know, this may be the right approach for a pandemic flu, but is a flu virus the only virus that we're going to have to deal with? And, you know, we had SARS and we had MERS, and both of those were in our memory. But I think the lessons of SARS and MERS were taken to heart in Asia in a way that they weren't in terms of our own pandemic preparations. Yes, the, 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 the actual report from Cygnus is not being published under FOI. Do you think it should be published? It might help aid the work of your committee. Well, I don't have a problem with it being published. But, you know, I think the, the reality is that we, we did learn lessons but there were clearly things that we needed to learn, irrespective of, of Cygnus, which was just one of a number of pandemic preparations. But as I say, the main thing was our preparedness for a, a different type of virus. One of the big benchmarks will be passed next week when the government will have to say whether they've got to 100,000 tests a, a day. Uh, is that a sensible target, do you think? Well, I have a lot of respect for Matt Hancock for announcing that target because, you know, it's a big thing for a politician not just to announce a target, but to announce a date when that target's going to be delivered by. And he did it to galvanise his officials and to galvanise the system. And, you know, my own view is that um, if we can get to that 100,000, it will be a game changer because it will mean that we have the opportunity to follow best practice in countries like Korea and Taiwan and Germany. And so I think we should welcome the ambition. I don't think this is a time for, you know, throwing darts at people because they, they might miss something by a small fraction. The important thing is that we are embracing the testing and contact tracing strategy that is being used by the countries that have been most successful in dealing with coronavirus. Yeah. When did you first start saying the words testing, testing, testing? I think it was about three weeks before everyone else, wasn't it? Well, I've, I've thought from the start that we should be looking much more closely at the Asian countries that have shown the biggest success in suppressing the virus. And I've always thought it's very striking that, you know, in Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, the shops, restaurants, offices are all open. They've remained open. The economic damage has been much less. The GDP stimulus that Korea announced is about half the size of the one that we've announced because they managed to keep so much more of the economy open. So I think the key thing is, you know, are we following international best practice? And I think it's not just testing, it's contact tracing. It's the whole package of being able to know where your enemy is and, and track that enemy wherever they are in the community. Uh, and that has 
been proven to be the most effective way. Uh, and this NHS app is going to work, do you think? This app which will allow people to, to track who they've been uh, uh, speaking to. The, the, I think the take-up has been quite low in other countries. Yes, I think technology has an important role to play. You know, it's fantastically exciting to think that your mobile phone could reveal which other mobile phones you've been within a couple of metres of in the last five days if you've got coronavirus and providing you can um, overcome civil liberties concerns. There's enormous potential there, but Singapore, which has got one of the best apps called the Trace Together app, I think they've only had about 20% of the population who've taken it up, and that's a very high-tech society. So we're not going to have a technology-exclusive solution. There's going to need to be a combination of tech from people who can use it, phoning others, and actually face-to-face visits with people wearing protective equipment. Because, um, you know, if a, an 80-year-old lady gets a fever or a cough, someone is going to go need to go and see her, get her tested and find out who she's been near in the last few days. Have you, there's a debate recently about whether we should be testing for oxygen levels in the blood, because often the, the oxygen levels can fall, but you only present with the symptoms quite, quite, quite far down that track and often too late at, at hospital. Should we be doing more testing the same way we test for temperature at home? You can test for oxygen levels in the blood as well. Well, I noticed that uh, Amazon is doing a brisk business in selling oximeters, which do that. And I do think that these things matter. One of the advantages of a mass community testing program, for example, that they have in Germany, is that if you test people earlier, so someone gets a fever and they they call 111 and then someone comes around within 24 hours and tests them, then if that person's vulnerable, you know, they've got an existing health condition or they're very elderly, you can monitor them much more closely and get them to hospital more quickly if they need help. And so that, I think, is one of the reasons why Germany has had a significantly lower death rate than other European countries. And of course, one of the things you're monitoring is oxygen levels. So um, again, that's where this testing programme can be so important. Yes, of course. Uh, The big issue for everyone is why we're talking from home to get together. When will this debate end? My 17-year-old daughter is 18 soon. She's asking me when she can see her friends. What, What would you say to her? Well, probably bad news, actually. I mean, I I think that we will get our shops, offices open fairly soon, but using social distancing. I think as soon as you've got uh, contact tracing up and running and mass testing up and running, you have a route to do that. But I think that the pubs, bars and clubs that your daughter might enjoy going to will probably be the last things to open. And that might take a bit longer, I'm sorry to say. These five tests to end the, lock, end the lockdown, you know, making sure the NHS can cope, are sustained and, and uh, consistent fall in day death rate, rate of infection, um, ensuring the supply of tests and PPE can meet demand and being confident any adjustments wouldn't bring a second peak. Uh, are, they, are they basically meaning, do you think, that the, essentially the lockdown ending is a political decision more than a scientific one? No, I think it is really about looking at the evidence, um, if you look at the evidence from Spanish flu, for example, a century ago, the American cities that ended the lockdown soonest and were less effective in controlling the spread of Spanish flu ended up with bigger economic damage than the more cautious cities that entered lockdown early and stayed in lockdown for longer. So it's it's not an either or between you know, economic considerations and health considerations, places that prioritised health tended to have less long-term economic damage. Yeah, so, so, so on that, I mean, I know there's been some concern from the 1922 committee who met virtually last night. Uh, there's concern about um, damaging the economy through this long lockdown. Where do you sit on that? There's this battle between health and wealth. I, I don't think it is a battle between health and wealth. I think that... Um, You know, if you get the health right, the wealth follows. And, you know, the way that we can get the economy going is by mass community testing and contact tracing. Uh, That's what they've done in in the Asian economies that haven't had to have the lockdown that we've had in Europe and and they've had in North America. And that's good for health and good for wealth. Yeah. Masks are surely going to be mandatory, aren't they, on public transport and elsewhere? Well, I think the challenge with masks is making sure that um, if you 
advise the public to wear masks. We don't suddenly end up with a shortage in the NHS where they're obviously absolutely critical. So I hope we are talking to mask manufacturers to make sure that we have a big national supply because we know that you can transmit the virus, uh, shed the virus when you are asymptomatic for a few days before the symptoms emerge. So it would seem like a no-brainer to ask people to wear masks in places like the tube or the buses where you can't observe the two-metre social distancing rule. But before you do that, you'd want to make sure that you're not going to create a shortage of supply for the hospitals and care homes. Yeah. Will you be wearing a mask when you go out or your, or, and your family? Well, I'm going to follow the advice that is given. As I say, I, I can see the logic for masks, but I would want to make sure that that wasn't going to affect the supply going to the NHS. There's been a big wrangle this week about the fact that there's lots of UK suppliers of personal protective equipment which can't get their kit to the NHS for various reasons. I mean, whether it's the, the um, ministers trying to take control or, or the NHS not being able to do it themselves. Um, why do you think that's been happening? Well, you know, it's incredibly difficult from the government's point of view, because since this has started, they have had thousands and thousands of calls from people who say they can supply equipment. And it's it's a very difficult logistical challenge to kind of filter through those calls to find the, the people who can really be of help. Yeah, the suppliers have been calling journalists saying they can't get in touch, touch with the government. And they've been calling the chair of the Health and Social Care Select Committee. So yeah. I think we've all had you a as number well. of those. Yes. <laughs> we've all had a number of those contacts. This will change, won't it, how we think of the NHS? Do you, th- do you think this is a moment in the NHS's history when I think it might reconnect even more than it had before with the nation? Well, I think the NHS has suffered in the past from being a bit of a political football. And, you know, Labour's always tried to claim they're the party of the NHS when actually it was a Conservative health minister in 1944 that first announced under the wartime coalition government that we were going to set up a national health service. Um, But that has been part of Labour's, uh, you know, founding mythology that they're the party of the NHS and it's come up to every election since then. I hope that what's happened in coronavirus can, can... finally lift the NHS out of the kind of narrow party politics that we have seen in the past. Um, But that still means we need to have a a proper, robust national debate about how to strengthen the NHS going forward and big issues around social care to solve, big areas like cancer survival rates where we're not doing as well as we we should like to. So there'll always be a big national debate, but I hope we can make it a more constructive debate going forward. Do you think it's right that nurses have to pay a registration fee just to be a nurse? It's about around £120 a year. There was a a petition in Parliament uh, a couple of years ago to try and end this fee. Do you think it should be ended now, given what they're going through? Well, I don't know the details of, of, you know, all the costs that people have to pay in the course of their their academic studies. And it's normal that people pay for some costs and not for other costs. But, you know, the big question is, are we getting the 50,000 nurses that the government has promised and that we know we need? So um, if money is a barrier, then we need to look at those barriers. But the most important thing of those is that recruitment drive. Yeah, totally. There's a campaign running for a 999 cenotaph to pay tribute to those who have lost their lives and uh, across the emergency services in this crisis. Would you support it? Uh, Well, I would support anything that recognises the bravery and sacrifice of NHS and care workers who have paid the ultimate price. How we do that, well, I'm sure we'll have a big debate, but I, I, in principle, support anything that does that job. It's a bit too early, as you say, for blame game, but is it not a risk, do you think, from all this, that it could actually end up costing the Tories the next election because of the, the, the party by then will be in, been in power for, you know, um, goodness, uh, uh, 13, 14 years by then. And, um, and a lot of these issues of preparedness or cuts, if they existed, and, and the cuts that were pushed through under austerity, will be blamed at the, at the Conservatives' doorstep. Well, Mao's number two, Zhou Enlai, when he was asked about the historical impact of the French Revolution, said it's too early to say. And if it was too early to say for the French <laughs> Revolution, it is definitely too early to say for coronavirus. We're right in the middle of it. We, we don't know what the final death rates will be. We don't know how that will compare to other countries. It could be Britain that 
finds the vaccine for coronavirus, you know. So there's lots of things that could happen. And I, I think it's just too early to make those judgments. So we're not even at half time yet, are we? If it's, an, if it's, a, if it's a football football match. We may well not. <laughs> we're probably in the first 10 minutes. Just a final question, Jeremy Hunt. Are you glad you're not prime minister? I wondered, given this, given this, what, what, this crisis enveloping it. Well, um, I'm, you know, very proud to be doing my current role, and um, I think that uh, Boris has made a tremendous start as prime minister. Let me answer the question this way: My family are absolutely delighted <laughs> that I'm not prime minister. <laughs> Well, that's all we have time for today. Huge thank you to my guests, Jeffy Cox QC MP and Jeremy Hunt MP. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wells, Edith Lampett, and of course, Theo Leludis. But most importantly of all, thank you to you for taking time to listen. Without you, this podcast wouldn't happen. Don't forget, if you work for the NHS, you can get a free six-month digital subscription to Telegraph as our way of saying thank you for your amazing work at these difficult times. I'll put details of that offer in the show notes for this episode. Everyone else, as usual, can get 30 days free access to Telegraph content by going to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper. If you want some more bonus readings from Jeffrey Cox, please follow us on Twitter at Chopper's Podcast. And also, well, just keep listening. We thought we'd end this week's episode with some more stirring words from Jeffrey Cox. So from me, it's cheerio and please enjoy Rudyard Kipling's If, read by the former Attorney General Geoffrey Cox, QC MP. This is If by Rudyard Kipling. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop, and build them up with worn-out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings, and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose and start again at your beginnings, and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. <laughs>